continue in our verse-by-verse study through the book of Numbers, and who knew that the book of Numbers would be this rich? Uh, I really did not uh, know that. It has been such a blessing in my heart. Trust for you as well. But we do come to chapter 6, and Numbers chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 21, as I was reading it and studying it, uh, it it's pretty straightforward. It's a uh, uh, historical narrative about uh, the uh, assigning of a particular um, observance and all. And I thought, well, it, it's all well and good. It's wonderful. But what, uh, what does that mean for me tw- in a 21st century American church uh, and, and an American culture when I am called to uh, be uh, in this world and not of this world? And so, it struck me uh, a week ago or so uh, what we could learn from this. And so if you'd make your way to Numbers chapter 6, a message I've titled, I vow to be in the world, not of the world. We continue in this verse-by-verse study through the book of Numbers. And the first three quarters or so of chapter 6 is what we're going to study today. And it really does complement or goes very much with our annual theme in, uh, in this message, uh, I vow to be in the world, not of the world. Let me read the, this passage for us, Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head, until the days be fulfilled in which... He separated himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and let the flocks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father, for his mother, for his brother, for his sister when they die, because the consecration of his God is upon his head. All the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord." And if any man die very suddenly by him, next to him, and he that defiled the head of his consecration, then he shall shave his head in the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day shall he shave it. And on the eighth day he shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering and make an atonement for him because he sinned by the dead and shall hallow his head that same day. And he shall consecrate unto the Lord the days of his separation, shall bring a lamb of the first year for a trespass offering, but the days that were before shall be lost because his separation was defiled, interrupted as it were by the presence of that dead body. I'm saying that parenthetically. And this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought into the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and he shall offer his offering unto the Lord, one he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, and one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, and one ram without blemish for peace offerings. And a basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mixed with oil, and wafers of unleavened bread, anointed with oil, and their meal offering and their drink offerings. And the priest shall bring them before the Lord, and shall offer his sin offering and his burnt offering. And he shall offer the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord. With the basket of unleavened bread, the priest shall offer also his meal offering and his drink offering. And the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He shall take the hair of the head of his separation and put it in the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. And the priest shall take the boiled shoulder of the ram and one unleavened cake out of the basket and one unleavened wafer and shall put them upon the hands of the Nazarite after the hair of his separation is shaved. 
and the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord that is holy for the priest with the wave uh, breast and heave shoulder. And after that, the Nazarite may drink wine. This is the law of the Nazarite who had vowed and his offering unto the Lord for his separation. Beside that, uh, that his hand shall get. According to the vow which he vowed, so he must do after the law of his separation. And aren't you glad you don't have to figure all of that out and preach it to you? <laughs> because it is cumbersome. Uh, it, it deals with the minutia of something of which we're not really all that familiar in 21st century America. But the Word of God, it talks about taking a vow, a voluntary vow, and taking a vow, a solemn vow before God is something that one is never to do lightly. In fact, in Ecclesiastes, the words of wisdom from Solomon tells us that when thou vowest a vow, if you're going to vow unto God, defer not to pay it. In other words, you better pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. That is how serious God is on this issue of making a vow, whatever the vow might be. So help me God when you say something such as that or intend something such as that, absolutely fulfill it uh, 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 to, to, the, to the end uh, if need be because it would be better not to vow than to vow and to not follow uh, that. And so here in chapter 6 verses 1 through 21 is a voluntary vow. Chapter 5 dealt with the, the law of, uh, of uh, uh, a commanded law, a compulsory law to preserve ceremonial, relational, and marital purity. Whereas in chapter 6, this is a voluntary uh, law that can be opted from those who would want to. And so, the Nazarite, the person who takes a Nazarite vow, it comes from the word which means separation. And the Nazarite, whether man or woman, it says right here, can commit himself or herself to live in such a way that it is obvious to one and all that he or she is separated unto the Lord. I am taking this space of time, and it's not, it's not uh, specified how long it could be. It could be a week, it could be a month, it could be a year. Presumably because of the nature of the, the issue of hair, uh, it was going to be somewhat lengthy. Maybe it would even be years, as in the case with Samson. But it would be obvious to one and all, this person has absolutely committed his all or her all to live a separated life unto the Lord. You'll notice in verse 2, it's a very intense uh, verb uh, in my study. It doesn't speak of the usual act of devotion that everyone is to have in following the Lord. But if you'll notice in verse 2, speaking of the children of Israel, when either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow. That is, if you will say in a voluntary way, I am utterly and completely sold out, delivered over unto uh, service and worship and dedication and consecration to the true and living God, to the degree that I'm going to live it out by not touching a grape, not touching anything having to do with grapes, not touching a dead body, and never cutting my hair as a physical, formal statement, then you go and do that. You are welcome to do that. But if you're going to make this vow, do not do it lightly, for God would say you are being foolish if that were the case. I've read a summary that chapter 5 concerns separation from evil in corporate life, whereas chapter 6 concerns separation unto God for the individual in a voluntary way. And so let's look at it very quickly, what this has to do with specifically, uh, and then I'll get into a time of application for us in our day. First of all, we see in verses 1 through 4, a vow of the Nazarite vow was to separate from the grapes. And it's difficult to know for sure why anything having to do with grapes 
uh, was a point of separation for the one under the Nazarite vow. Very clearly, uh, grapes, uh, grape juice, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, even the fermentation of it was something that was practiced in, uh, to a great degree in Old Testament times, uh, as much as with anything. And so to remove oneself from that is making a, a really a, a pretty significant statement. Uh, and this person is saying, I will not touch anything that has to do with the grape plant, the grape vine. The uh, Old Testament Hebrew language scholars, uh, Kiel and Delich, uh, wrote regarding the separation from anything having to do with the grapes. He says, the fruit uh, was uh, regarded, that is the fruit of the grape vine, as the sum and substance of all sensual enjoyment. Not, not sensual in a, uh, in a um, uh, lascivious way, but of all physical enjoyment. It provided much of uh, fulfillment uh, in the longing for that which was sweet, that which was refreshing, and the like. And so to deny oneself of that and to do so as a Nazarite vow is to say, God, you are my complete fulfillment, <clears throat> is in essence what uh, it could very well be saying. One further comment on this <clears throat> by uh, the commentator uh, Marsing said, in itself, wine culture was considered to be good. Israelites regarded the harvest of their vineyards as a blessing, but there was also a dangerous side to it, the possibility of lapsing into a pagan lifestyle. And uh, of course, to some degree, uh, there's in, uh, inherent within that uh, the abuse of the uh, the, the uh, produce of wine, it being fermented uh, and then it being intoxicating. We have plenty of biblical examples of the danger of that. So, a vow to separate from anything having to do with grapes. Secondly, we see in verse 5, a vow to separate from cutting your hair. Uh, of the three things that are mentioned in the Nazarite vow, to me, uh, this seems to be the most unusual, and yet it is so specific that the Lord spoke unto Moses, and if any man or woman uh, will become a Nazarite for a season, it doesn't say for how long, then he or she must not cut the hair. You say, well, uh, that's not particularly noteworthy for women uh, because uh, long hair was uh, their glory anyway. Well, yes. But it very well could be that the way it was practically played out is not only did the women not cut their hair, they didn't put their hair up. Because throughout time, uh, hair, uh, when you're working around the house and you're uh, doing this, it can get heavy. Uh, and it can be hot. And it can uh, get caught in things and all. And so uh, it very well could be that it meant not putting it up in a bun, not having a ponytail as it were. I'm speculating. We don't know. But either way, the hair was to be left untouched during this time. Let me offer um, three uh, suggestions from, from theologians and then uh, give you my preferred understanding. Uh, any of these, I guess, could be uh, accurate. Again, Marsing, uh, the idea of not cutting the hair might have been a, a, for a negative reason. Um, in many nations at this time, people devoted their hair to their gods, which uh, maybe uh, this has some substance to it because at the end of the Nazarite vow, they were told when they cut their hair, what were they to do with that hair according to this passage? They were to burn it so that it could not be used in any other way. It was to be incinerated. Uh, maybe that has some merit. Um, Smick wrote, hair is um, uh, representative of life itself. For only a living man, a human, produces hair. He offered it, therefore, in place of his own body as a sign that he himself was a living sacrifice, holy, well-pleasing to God. Maybe that has merit. Uh, Jacob Milgram, the uncut hair of the Nazarite is truly his distinction. And I like that, but I don't think he went f far enough. I prefer it, it being portrayed in the life of of Samson and Constable wrote, the long hair of the Nazarite would have been symbolized, would have symbolized the dedication of the Nazarite strength and vigor to God. And of course, uh, that is played out in and through the life of Samson, who had taken the Nazarite vow. Maybe better yet, uh, the Nazarite vow, vow uh, was, was given to him. So, a vow to separate from haircuts. And then we see 
in verses 6 through 21, uh, inclusive, uh, because it has to do with ending the vow as well, a vow to separate from the dead. And this is easy to understand uh, because uh, it's, uh, it posits uh, the reason, uh, since the fruit of sin is separation, separation from God, and sin's ultimate fulfillment uh, is in death, then it follows that to touch death is to touch sin. The wages of sin is death. Uh, and you're to separate from that, and your vow that you're making is, I'm not going to be around that which is dead. And there was even a, an occasion given, uh, if it were an accidental occurrence of uh, somebody just drops dead right next to you, uh, or uh, maybe uh, your spouse uh, dies in, in bed during the night, or I mean, you can just imagine anything. Then there are, there's even provision for that to continue on in the Nazarite vow, though it was interrupted for that season. So, these three reasons uh, were given uh, as taking the Nazarite vow. And Salehammer summarized this whole law by saying this law specifically shows that there were provisions, not just for the priests, but for all members of God's people to commit themselves wholly to God. Complete holiness was not the sole prerogative of the priesthood or the Levites. The Nazarite vow shows that even lay persons, men and women, in everyday walks of life could enter into a state of complete devotion to God. Thus, this segment of text teaches that any person, person in God's nation could be totally committed to holiness. So taking the Nazarite vow back in that day, they had just come out of Egypt, this law is given, taking it for a period of time, was intended for good through a concentrated time of piety, consecration, attention to the Lord. Now, is there anything in our day, right now, 21st century America, that might be um, uh, consistent with that same idea? For the believer, not compulsory, but voluntary to designate a period of time where you are going to give a special attention uh, to God and the things of God. We call that what? Fasting. That's exactly right. And so it's not fasting, this text is not, but we see that, that parable, if you will, that uh, comparison in that. Now, whenever you do something like that, there is an inherent danger Whenever, and, and here's the practical thing that came to me, I say, okay, Vic, this is fine. I get it. I understand it. I don't know exactly all the reasons why uh, this was uh, uh, required, but I see that it was something uh, that if you take this vow, you are required to fulfill it this way. And so I asked myself, so what? Well, the so what that came to me was that there is a real danger in voluntarily taking the Nazarite vow, as there is in voluntarily saying, I'm going to give myself to prayer and fasting for a season of time, or voluntarily saying, I'm going to sing a solo, or I'm going to teach a Sunday school class, or I'm going to be, uh, 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 respond to the call to be a deacon, or I'm going to work as an Awana leader, or I'm going to support missions. There is an inherent danger in saying in committing to doing any or all of those things. And here's the inherent danger. Self-righteousness. That is a danger which could and will, in fact, face all of us. Folks, because it feels good to get accolades. Oh, can you imagine uh, all those thousands of years ago, somebody walking around the camp of Israel, and that person's hair, that guy's hair has grown long, uh, and you notice uh, that uh, he, uh, he, didn't, he didn't attend the funeral of his grandmother, and uh, he didn't, uh, wasn't a pallbearer in his grandfather's uh, funeral, and, and what's more, he won't uh, even come around uh, uh, the grape harvest, and on and on. Wow, he is really something sp uh, spiritual. He is really committed to the Lord. That sounds nice to our ears. Can you, can you identify with how that, the temptation would be to uh, look how uh, great he is and say, yeah, come on, bring it on, bring it on, tell me more. The inherent danger in this sort of a thing is spiritual pride. And, of course, the Pharisees were swallowed up in that, folks. I am here to tell you and to tell myself and to remind myself that he will not share his glory with another 
even with one of his children. He won't share his glory with another. He won't share it with you. He won't share it with me. He wants me to reflect his glory. He commands me to pray in his name. He commands me to reflect what his greatness is, to witness in his strength, to give uh, unto, for uh, as if I'm giving unto him, to serve, uh, uh, to wait tables, to wash feet, as if I am doing that for Jesus himself. Because in, if I'm doing it in his name, I really am doing that for him. And so the temptation for pride is strong and real. Uh, humility says it's all about God and not about me. Jonathan Edwards wrote, pride is the saint's hardest conflict. And it must have been for those who took the Nazarite vow as well. If you will do this unto me, if you will do this because of me, then I'm pleased. And I delight in that. But if you are doing it to acquire accolades, if you put the offering in the plate, if you want somebody else to know about it, uh, if you teach that class and people pat you on the back, if you sing a solo, if whatever, visit in that nursing home, give to missions, uh, get a shoebox for Christmas and fill it with uh, uh, special blessings for children. And anyone, if you can do all of that and no one else know about it, then to God be the glory. But the temptation is for me, for you, that it does feel good when others know about it. C.S. Lewis wrote, pride is the great sin. It's the one vice of which no man in the world is free, which everyone in the world hates when he sees it in someone else. Oh, that, that arrogance is so ugly, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine they are guilty themselves. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next guy. And so the nature of pride is that it's universal and it's unrelenting. It is everywhere and it never gives up to the degree and one of my grandsons got a chuckle out of this reading my notes on my computer last night, uh, coming back on the airplane. When I had on my notes, I said, some folks are proud of their humility. <laughs> Sad. But I'm so hum- I thank thee, God, that I am not like that guy under the bridge or that pervert or that blasphemer but look at how I have known you and followed you. You can, you can, you can feel, you can sense the ugliness of, uh, of a spirit such as that. The operation of pride, it's multifaceted. It, it's the root of selfishness in action and attitude. And yet we see it contrasted in the glory of humility. MacArthur wrote, Humility is the most foundational Christian virtue. Now, you say, I I agree, I agree. How is that going to play out in my life? Well, think about this. Have you ever noticed that when you do something voluntary, in a selfless way, even in a generous way, that you're at least tempted that someone else will notice, that you have a little bit of an urge that you can drop a hint, or something along that way. If you're not even tempted to do that, then, brother, you've arrived, (laughs) and I want to have a little of that. Because the temptation for all of us saved Jesus. Actually, he was tempted too, and yet he had victory over that. The temptation is there, I would argue, for all of us. And so the next time someone tells you a story, or shares an accomplishment with you, or about someone else, are you prone to want to insert what you have done, maybe in that same arena? Uh, It is a subtle thing that comes at us 
all the time. <clears throat> you say, no, I don't want to be noticed. Now follow this. Pride is a major motivation for those who want to be noticed. But it could also be the motivation for those who don't want to be noticed. I'd rather just be in the background. I'd rather just go into the recesses of the walls and no one comment to me, talk to me uh, about all of the, my accomplishments. Now, why is that the case? Well, if you're embarrassed when someone gives you a compliment, maybe it's because that person has brought to your attention and the attention of others of something in your life that's not deserved. And you know that it's not deserved. Or maybe it could be that you might be quizzed about it and standing up in front of others makes you very uncomfortable. Um, To talk about what you've, you've done. Well, why would that make you uncomfortable? Because I might stumble over words and I might blow it because I'm so fearful. Well, why does that make you uncomfortable? Because I don't want to be embarrassed. Why don't you want to be embarrassed? Uh-oh. Because I'm too proud to be embarrassed in front of a group. Y'all following how subtle that can be? Pride can even be that which motivates not wanting to be noticed as much as it can be of wanting to be noticed. So how do you defeat it? How do you have victory over pride? If you took the Nazarite vow in that day, if you committed for a season of praying and fasting and you have that feeling that you want someone else to notice You want to be uh, that puffed up feeling. How can you have victory in that? Well, I want to offer two points and we're done. First, you have to have a biblical view of man. You must have a biblical view of man. If I truly see myself as who I am, one who outside of Christ deserved hell, and I did, one who was an enemy of the Lord, One whose sin put him on the cross. If I see myself in a biblical, with a biblical lens, then I'll not have pride nearly as much as a knee-jerk reaction to what happens in my life. Proverbs 6.6 says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven or an abomination unto him. The very first one right out of the gate, a proud look. Someone who sees himself as better than others, as greater, as more spiritual, more generous, more faithful. You just fill in the blank. And the Lord says he hates that. He resists the proud. And he only offers grace to those who will say, I am needy. Father, meet me at my point of need. I'm dependent on you. So a biblical view of man and then a biblical view of God. <clears throat> For only with a biblical view of God can you do what 1 Peter 5, 5 says and it commands, be clothed with humility. And so you're clothed with humility by making your focus Directing your attention, whether you took a Nazarite vow, whether you commit to prayer and fasting in our day, when you take the approach of, Lord, this is unto you, for you, and you might need to say that and do that multiple times throughout the course of that because the temptation for self-righteousness is going to continue to knock at the door. I close with this. I read that humility is not thinking poorly of oneself. Humility is not thinking of oneself. (laughs) Easily said, right? Not easily done. Jonathan Edwards wrote, It is by pride that the mind defends itself in other errors. Well, yeah, I did that. But what about this? Look at all the good things. Or he did it worse than me. Any of your kids uh, ever use that? Caught with the hand in the cookie jar? Well, she took two cookies, though. Pride. 
trying to defend self. Defends itself in other errors and guards itself against the light by which it might be corrected and reclaimed. Well, I think I'm good enough. Uh, I think uh, my good works are going to outweigh my bad works. And somebody's going to carry that weight all the way into hell, unforgiven, unredeemed, because of self-righteousness. So, we've looked at the Nazarite vow. It was voluntary. But if you vow it, Moses was told, you had better keep it. And we who know and follow and love the Lord Jesus, it is by grace we've been saved through faith, not of ourselves. But when we take on a special, extraordinary commitment, whatever that might be, giving to missions, singing in the choir, working on a committee, serving in Awana, whatever it may, uh, 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 opening up the home for a small group, being a small group leader, you, there's just any number of things, whatever it might be, check the heart. Why am I doing what I'm doing? It must be for his glory alone. For the flesh, say the rest with me, prophets, <clears throat> oh, there's not, there's not 15 of you convinced of that. One more try. You may have dozed off. You may, you may have had to answer an urgent text. You may have been in the middle of the grocery list. The flesh profits nothing. Nothing. There's no value. If it is not for him unto him. So take all the Nazarite vows you deem that you desire to, transferring that over to 21st century America, but the one that you take and those that you take <clears throat> unto him and for him fulfill faithfully. Lord, I'm thankful for your word. How the direct interpretation seems distant, remote, um, not, um, not relevant to us in 21st century America, but the practical application and the implications are as real as why I preached this message today and why we're even here and attended today and why we put something in the offering plate or any number of other motivations. And so, Lord, would you search my heart, search our hearts, the best I know, I want us and me to live in the freedom of humility, wholly dependent on you and not trusting self and our own so-called righteousness. But righteousness can only be imputed to our account by you, deposited for us by what you have done. So may we be convicted and convinced to leave here this day not thinking poorly of ourselves, just not even worrying about any accolades or any such thing, but that you and you alone would receive glory through all we are and all we do as your people, Lord Jesus, in your blessed name.